Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless ohio voters enshrine abortion rights in state constitution cheer and cry in celebration of the killing of innocent babies americans did make their views very clear on election day and they had a whole lot to say the results show abortion rights are a big issue for voters this was especially clear in ohio that's a red state, as you know, where voters chose to enshrine abortion rights in the state's constitution. Let's just start with there was a large turnout there this year. There was not a governor or president on the ballot. That says something. It absolutely says something. It says that people were very concerned about the issue of abortion rights. And Democrats, as you pointed out, had several victories last night in this off election year, especially here in Ohio when it comes to women's reproductive rights. Women strongly backed this measure overall, but what's very interesting too is when you break out both men and women under the age of 30, 80% of them also voted yes on this issue according to a CBS News exit poll. <laughs> Abortion rights advocates in Ohio erupted. <laughs> in celebration Tuesday night after the state voted to protect access to the procedure. I was crying tears of complete joy and shock and just overwhelmed. I was just overwhelmed that we can actually affect change. The past amendment called issue one guarantees a woman's right to an abortion in the state's constitution. It allows for the procedure until fetal viability, usually around the 23rd week, but also makes exceptions for the mother's health. The impact of passing issue one will be felt throughout the state and for generations and generations to come. Since Roe v. Wade was overturned more than a year ago, abortion rights supporters have now prevailed in all seven states where the issue was on the ballot. The Supreme Court wanted to kick it back to the states. We have taken on that mantle. Despite the loss, groups that oppose abortion rights vowed to continue their fight. We stand ready during this unthinkable time to advocate for women and the unborn just as we have always done. Ohio's issue one will take effect next month. And President Biden weighed in on this, uh, tweeting last night that this was an attempt to reject what voters didn't want, saying that it would have imposed an extreme abortion ban that put the health and lives of women in jeopardy. What about the baby's health and life? Is abortion murder? The Bible is clear. Murder is wrong, as stated in Exodus 2013. You shall not murder. Murder is defined is the unlawful, premeditated killing of one human being by another. Killing is done by the judgment of one human being against another for personal reasons. The Bible condemns murder repeatedly as a characteristic of a wicked society and places a person in danger of the judgment, as we read in Matthew 5.21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. So, is a fetus a human? Or is it something else? Biologically speaking, human life begins at conception. No more genetic material needs to be added when the mother's egg and the father's sperm come together. They combine and create a new string of DNA that is personalized and totally unique. DNA is coded in information, the blueprint for the new human's growth and development. When a mother has an abortion, she is destroying a unique life. The Bible clearly teaches that conception is the beginning of human life as we read in Judges 16, 17, that he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Samson refers to his unborn self as having already been what God planned him to be, a Nazarite. Again, the psalmist King David wrote that he was wonderfully made by God in his mother's womb as we read in Psalm 139, 13 through 16. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you 
when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. God says that he knew the prophet Jeremiah before he was in his mother's womb. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. King Solomon, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, wrote about the child in a mother's womb. As you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God, who makes everything. A baby in the womb has feelings, as we read in Luke 1.44. For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. The baby, who would be known as John the Baptist, experienced the emotion of joy when Mary, being pregnant with the incarnate Jesus, entered Elizabeth's home. There have been over 61 million abortions in America since it was legalized in 1973. God's word has a lot to say about killing the innocent. Proverbs 24, 11, and 12. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, Behold, we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? Proverbs 6, 16-19 These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. The Bible teaches that at conception, an unborn child is a human being that God is forming. It doesn't really matter what humans mandate is socially or politically acceptable. God's law takes precedence, as we read in Acts 5.29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. A mother who decides to abort her child is making a decision to end another person's life, and that is, and always has been, the definition of murder. There is good news for anyone who has had an abortion, and that is, that God offers forgiveness to anyone who confesses their sins, as we read in 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We now live in an Isaiah 520 world where evil is good and good is evil, where the sin of being a homosexual or transgender is openly celebrated and even glorified. One of the many signs that we are living in the end times is the epidemic of homosexuality that is sweeping the world today. Jesus said he would return at a time when society parallels the days of Lot, as we read in Luke 17, 28 through 30. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. To find out what parallels our days with the days of Lot, we need to go back to the book of Genesis. Genesis 19, 1-5 now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may know them. The term know them isn't a friendly handshake and how are you. It is to know them in a sexual way. What parallels our days with the days of Lot is homosexuality. While many soon-to-be parents are setting up baby registries, we set our goal at 50000 for the GoFundMe because um, ultimately that is an average give or take of what insurance companies would be covering for that IVF treatment. Kyle and Jack Morelli are joining many other gay couples setting up crowdfunding sites, looking for help with the estimated $150,000 to $200,000 cost of having a baby through surrogacy. I'm the one who proposed. Jack was very surprised. He did not know it was coming. Wow. You did? <laughs> That's news to me. The Long Island, New York couple, together for 10 years, got married and bought a home. Having a biological child is the next step in their plan. We wanted 
kids. We wanted, you know, that type of life. They expected insurance to cover the creation of their embryos, included in most fertility coverage. Then their insurance company told them they didn't qualify. What went through your mind? We felt discriminated against. We kind of felt alienated in a weird way. Jack and Kyle already invested $65,000 and expect surrogacy to cost another $180,000. They're not giving up, though, taking a loan against their home and second jobs to fund their journey. And it's motivated them to advocate for others. There's a stigma that two men can't raise a child together or that men are incapable of raising children on their own. And it's something that we want to stop. Homosexuality is strongly condemned in the Bible. Ezekiel 16, 49 through 50. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and an abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw fit. What was this prideful abomination committed before God? The answer is found in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 18.22 You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Leviticus 20.13 If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. God gives mankind a dire warning for the acts of homosexuality in 2 Peter 2.6 And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. God also offers forgiveness to those who are living a life of homosexuality as we read in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We've been saying for years men should not play women's sports. Whether it's trans men crushing girls' swimming records or high school guys spiking volleyballs into girls' faces, giving them concussions, ba-boom, that's not a level playing field, and it's getting dangerous. Last week in Massachusetts, a male playing on a women's high school field hockey team sent an opposing female player to the hospital after he drilled her in the face with a slap shot. He knocked her teeth out, caused major damage to her face. Watch. Field hockey is one of the fastest sports in the world. Balls can reach speeds 100 miles an hour. And the guy who did this, four-year varsity player, a co-captain, and he's allowed to play with the girls because of a technicality. Remember, just because something is equal doesn't mean it's fair. Massachusetts School Superintendent Bill Rooney joins us now. Bill, that has to be tough to watch your girls get their teeth knocked in by guys on a field hockey field. It's traumatic. I mean, the, if you listen to the video, it's um, bone chilling and um, you know, we're, we're a small district. Uh, we draw from two towns. To see those girls, the trauma that was on their faces when I greeted their bus that night um, is something that I will never, ever forget. I mean, what about the parents? I mean, the parents are putting their daughter's physical safety in jeopardy if they have them playing against guys. I've seen kids get injured. Injuries are going to happen. Females versus females, males versus males. The severity of the injury is what we have to look at here. And, you know, the, the MIAA um, made a statement. That's the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association. They made a statement in, re in, in response to this. And they said the arguments about safety typically fail because there's not a correlation between mixed gender, mixed sex sports and injuries. If this isn't a correlation, then I don't understand what the word means. Yeah, I mean, you can just look at golf. Similar swing, probably similar ball speed. Men can just hit the ball f faster and harder. And there's, just, there's just no way around that. And now people's lives are in danger. If this thing hits her in the head in the right way here in the temple, you could have had a homicide on your hands. I hope you guys change the rules. I hope something's done about this. And I hope this guy can maybe try hockey instead. And my heart goes out to the girl and her family. We really hope everything gets better. Romans 1:18 through 25. 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, and the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature, rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Romans chapter 1 tells us God has revealed to mankind that He is the Creator of all things, and that He has made it known to mankind that they are without excuse through His creation that He exists. God demands that we worship Him and recognize Him as the Creator. And when a society does not glorify Him as God, He gives them up to three phases of judgment. Romans 1 verse 24 says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts. The first phase of judgment is an impure heart. The second phase of judgment is of the body, verses 26 and 27. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. The third phase of judgment is in verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind, to do those things which are not fitting. First, the heart is rotten, then the body follows, and then the mind goes. The moral law of God written on the heart has literally been stomped out and replaced with cultural immorality. Immorality now goes in every direction. The mind is corrupt. People don't think right. They advocate all the wretched things and depreciate all the virtuous things. And what flows out of this pornographic, homosexual, depraved culture? All evil. Verses 29 through 32. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. In these last days, society has not retained God in their knowledge, and in return, God has given them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Verse 32 brings Romans chapter 1 to an end with a very bleak view of human nature. The point of the last half of the verse is to show that many people not only do things that they know deserve death, but also entice others to do them and approve when they do. In other words, the end point of depravity is not just the love affair with sin, but the desire to bring others with you to destruction. It's not just that people choose death for themselves in the passion of sin, but that they become suicidal at the spiritual level and assist others in eternal self-destruction by approving their sin. We are watching this play out right before our very eyes. Now, do you like the idea of free boob jobs for death row inmates? Well, you better, because you're paying for them. More than $4 million, taxpayer cash, has been used to give 150 California prisoners sex changes, or gender-affirming care, whatever that means. Almost 1,000 more are on the sex change waiting list. Ooh, goody. Four of these people are on death row. So what's the point? It's like getting your car washed before a thunderstorm. Doesn't matter. But it's not just boob jobs. The state spent 2.5 mil on vagina plasties. Ever heard of that? I haven't. And hundreds of thousands of bucks were on laser hair removal. I guess you can't shave with a straight razor in prison, so I don't know if they could give them nair at the commissary. I mean, are they doing this just so they can get sent to a women's prison? We don't know. California's lost its mind. It's a massive waste of money, but the people in charge don't care. They believe these procedures are life-saving. Does life-saving procedures make any sense if someone's on death row? 
I don't think so. And the trans-industrial complex loves it. They can perform it. They can create a lifetime patient, even if that patient's life is spent behind bars at San Quentin or ends in four years because of lethal injection. Just in the days of Noah, when God sent a flood, and in the days of Lot, when God sent fire and brimstone to judge mankind, he is about to send his final judgments on a wicked and unrepentant world. These terrible judgments are pictured as seven seals opened, seven trumpets blown, and seven bowls poured out. The first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal and the white horse rides, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal and the red horse rides, war will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the third seal and the black horse rides, famine will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the fourth seal and the pale horse rides, death and Hades will be unleashed. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. For five long days, this woman had been unable to leave her home. Carried by the fire brigade and put safely into a lifeboat, she finally decided that enough was enough on Tuesday. At my house, there's no heating, nothing, no electricity. I'm happy to go to a house where it's warm. In this small town on the northern tip of France, one in three residents have been forced out of their homes by historic floods, two in the space of just five days. The water reached its peak on Tuesday morning. As a result, in one house, everything has had to be thrown away. We emptied out the water and now it's rising back up. It's a nightmare. We lost everything. We've got nothing left. Since last Thursday, the family has had to live upstairs without electricity or heating. This is my grandfather. He's 88 years old. That's why we can't leave. With the cold weather, he will catch a cold. It's a life cut off from the outside world. Looking out this window is the only way to monitor the water levels. It's been a week that we've been living this tragedy. The fire brigade, coupled with members of the local community, are doing their best to keep spirits up delivering coffee and hot meals to isolated residents. They're great. They brought us breakfast and a hot meal at lunch. The water levels began to recede on Tuesday, but the respite may be brief, with further rain forecast in the coming days. Three years of drought have forced more than a million people from their homes in Somalia many of them into camps like this one in the capital Mogadishu. Now their shelters are being washed away by floods after days of torrential rains. It's raining for a fifth day. Our makeshift shelters were washed away. Children are missing now. We don't know whether they're dead or alive. We request the aid agencies to urgently help us. Most of the people in the camps were herders until the pastures became too dry and more than a million livestock died of thirst. Others were farmers who could no longer grow crops. Now, swathes of the countryside are underwater. The UN's Intercontinental Panel on Climate Change 
or IPCC, says the Horn of Africa is one of the places in the world that's most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. There is quite a big irony around people fleeing for uh, the fact that they don't have water and now fleeing because they have too much water. And so it's a real uh, dichotomy or problem that we're seeing. And the IPCC report quite clearly says that this cycle of flooding and drought is going to continue. And we're going to see this more and more unless we really do something on a global scale to try to reduce these uh, and try to stay on this Paris 1.5 alignment. Decades of armed conflict, as well as increased food prices exacerbated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, have made the crisis worse. The UN says more than 40,000 people died last year because of the drought, about half of them children. These floods are now killing even more. Hurricane Katrina. Hurricane Laura. Hurricane Delta. And Hurricane Ida. Four major hurricanes slamming the Louisiana coast. Three in just a span of two years. These record-breaking storms forcing communities to adapt to the devastating effects of climate change. Unfortunately, I think this is our new normal. The number of storms that we're seeing as I go from state to state and talk to these communities that have been impacted. We have to take it serious. We have to do our part now to make sure that future generations have a safe place to live. Reggie Ferreira, director of the Resiliency Leadership Academy at Tulane University, says the impact on mental health is staggering and long-lasting. These storms we experience here in Louisiana are quite devastating. We see impacts such as anxiety, depression, stress. A recent study said the pain is felt globally. About 85% of the world's population is already feeling the effects of human-caused climate change. Everything from worsening storms to more frequent wildfires and heat-driven health issues. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken, because he was angry. As we mentioned at the top of the broadcast, many of us probably felt a large shake earlier this morning. This video is from one of our viewers, Rudy Amador, just outside his home. Now, according to the, the uh, U.S. Geological Survey, just before 3.30 this morning, a 5.3 magnitude earthquake took place near Mentone, Texas. Talk about a shaky start to the day. West Texas residents woke up to a 5.3 magnitude earthquake. 
Now, this is the fourth strongest on record for the state since 1900. And according to the United States Geological Survey, the quake hit around 427 a.m. So it woke a lot of folks most likely out of their beds. Kind of a scary way to wake up, right? And the earthquake, it struck near the town of Minton, Texas. But the fact that this was a rather strong earthquake is certainly uh, something to kind of mention. Notice you can see where it falls in terms of Texas's top earthquakes in fourth place. And then you can see it's close behind the Colson Draw 5.4 magnitude earthquake that occurred not too long ago, just back in 2021. And then the top list, uh, the, the earthquake top on our list, Valentine, a 5.8 magnitude earthquake that occurred quite some time ago, back in 1931. As we look at the news, there is no doubt we are in the birth pains Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24:8. We see many of God's remedial judgments manifesting as if God is warning us of things to come and calling on people to repent. We see war and rumors of wars, famine, and pestilence resulting in the deaths of thousands around the world. We are seeing earthquakes, extreme heat, floods, wildfires, tornadoes, hailstorms, and hurricanes, all at record levels of frequency and intensity, just like Jesus said would happen just prior to his return. The judgments God will use to punish mankind with during the seven-year tribulation will be much worse than any of us can imagine. Still, this is God's grace and mercy, proving to everyone that these judgments come from him and he is still offering forgiveness of sins through his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I implore you to do so today as we are not guaranteed tomorrow. The IDF is destroying the massive terror infrastructure Hamas has built there for years. Prime Minister Netanyahu is calling the military campaign so far a phenomenal success, and Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. The commander of the Southern Command said for the first time in decades, the IDF is fighting in the heart of Gaza City. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Galan says Gaza is the biggest terrorist base ever built by man. This entire city is one big terror base. There are kilometers of tunnels underground. They are connected to hospitals, to schools. They are connected to each other. They have communication rooms, ammunition depots, places to sleep in order to serve as bases of terrorism from which the citizens of the state of Israel and IDF soldiers can be harmed. IDF forces have located and destroyed a number of tunnels. They uncovered one tunnel next to this amusement park and another tunnel and weapons depot near a civilian university. The IDF says it proves Hamas uses its civilian population as human shields. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is calling the military campaign so far a phenomenal success, with countless Hamas bases, tunnels, and command and control centers destroyed. We will win. We will not stop until victory. I am in continuous contact with U.S. President Joe Biden. We very much appreciate his support, the support of the American administration, and the support of the American people. Netanyahu also said there'll be no ceasefire without the return of the hostages. Yet Axios is reporting President Joe Biden is asking Netanyahu for a three-day pause in the fighting so more hostages can be released. The report goes on to say Netanyahu doesn't trust Hamas and Israel could lose international support. Given the alarming rise of anti-Semitism and public support for Hamas in the past month, U.S. Jewish groups are calling for a massive march for Israel in Washington, D.C. on November 14th. On Capitol Hill, the House passed a $14 billion bipartisan aid package last week, but the Senate has blocked the legislation. Speaker of the House Mike Johnson met with some of the 240 hostage families. He defended Israel's military actions. This is clearly, as we said so many times, good versus evil. The United States stands with the good, and we're going to stand with Israel, and that show of force, I think, is intentional and appropriate. One family member came with a warning to the West. This is a call for action. And this is a wake-up call, not only for Israel, not only for the Jewish community. This is a wake-up call for all of, you, all of you here, all of America, all of Europe. You are next. You are next. And we should do everything that we can to stop these atrocities. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. 
for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.